So the session today is all about promoting your organisation. It's designed for SMEs and VCSEs typically, but for any organisation actually who are wanting to either start out or grow in the public sector. So quick introductions. As I said, I'm Gillian Askew. I'm your host for today. I'm also the co-founder of Go For Growth um, and I'm a procurement professional by trade. I'm coming up to 30 years in procurement now. Uh, the first 18 years of my career I spent in private sector procuring for SMEs, but also FTSE 250 and FTSE 100. Uh, but the latter part of my career has all been spent in procurement in the public sector. But I'm also a long-standing small business and social enterprise owner and I, I think what that gives me is the ability to see the challenges from both lenses. So I definitely understand the challenge that the public sector faces when going out to market and the procurement challenges that that throws into play. But also uh, I've definitely walked a mile in small business owners shoes when trying to interpret those challenges and find and secure work and build relationships outside of that competition process with the public sector. Kevin, over to you. Thank you very much. So my name is Kevin Drazy. I'm Head of Procurement and Contract Management at North Yorkshire County Council. I'm also the Chair of the Yorkshire and Humber Strategic Procurement Group, which is the Head of Procurement Group for all of the local authorities in the Yorkshire and Humber region. And we're working with Go for Growth in terms of support for SMEs and VCSEs, essentially to be able to win more contracts with ourselves and with the a wider public sector and as, a, as an interest again like Jill I'm a long-standing procurement professional not as long as Jill but certainly getting there uh, around 20 years but really keen to see that vibrant resilient supply chain where SMEs uh, and VCSEs can really compete uh, on a level playing field and win business uh, with the public sector so that's something I'm really personally quite passionate around uh, also as part of my day job too so really pleased to be here and hopefully can answer some of your questions uh, and give you some pointers around how you can be more uh, successful in this area. Thank you, Kevin. That's great. So just firstly, as an introduction, we're going to talk about why we're doing any of this today. Um, and, I, and I think really a lot of it comes down to market stability. So we've really been through the mill um, in, in all business sectors. Uh, but definitely smaller organisations have been hit hard recently. We've had austerity measures and fingers crossed, touch wood, we're coming out the other side of a global pandemic. But the last 18 months have just been really devastating. And so the government mandate actually is really important. Um, it brings about even more stability into what is a stable market in a volatile economic environment. Public services are going to always be procured. There will always be a need to buy those public services. So the market itself isn't going anywhere and it's worth around 290, 300 billion each year. And the government's mandate of 33% of all spend to go to SMEs, as well as delivering public good, which I'll talk about in a second, that mandate of 33%, whilst it might only be a central government mandate per se, actually it's not a bad measure for the wider public sector. And the public sector that we talk to all the time has got ambitions that actually, I think, really far outstrip that 33% of all spend. But if we stay with that number for a second, if 33% if of all wider public sector market spend actually did get directed to small to medium enterprises and VCSEs, that's a market worth around 92 billion. And as I say, there's real stability in the public sector market, in that public service procurement is going to continue. It will be funded. It is going to be there for the long term. And so now could be a really great time to think about the public sector as a growth environment or as an environment to diversify into. And especially when we overlay the devastation of COVID-19. But it's not the only crises that we face, actually. You know, climate emergency is changing how markets look and feel and how we procure and what we procure. There are lots of industries that have got real pressures on them. 
And I think um, the Federation of Small Businesses were saying that COVID-19 on its own um, would be potentially responsible for the closure of 250,000 small businesses. That's 5% of the small business market in the UK. So that's a devastating effect. And I think that 23% of organisations that FSB polled suggested that they'd had to cut their staff numbers in order just to survive the, the global pandemic. And so if you layer all the other challenges onto it, public sector could be a really great market to be in. And especially when you think about the delivery of public good, and you might know that as social value or corporate social responsibility, sustainability, inclusive growth. There are lots of terms. Social value is the one that is talked about most often. All the public sector are looking to their civic responsibilities, whether that's an NHS foundation trust, a police authority, a local authority, a higher education institution, school, etc. Every public sector organisation, including central government, is tasked with thinking about the social impact of the taxpayers' money that they spend. And if you think about big ticket social items like homelessness, worklessness or poverty, arguably those things can't be eradicated or even dealt with in any meaningful way without having a stable and growing local economy. And I think really what the pandemic has taught us that's a huge positive for SMEs and VCSEs is the power that smaller organisations really bring to bear in terms of that local economic development piece. Um, you know, they are the key, we are, small businesses are the key to 21st century public service delivery. We innovate, we're responsive, and everything that we're doing is looking to develop and build on resilience for the future and really expand that local economic development piece. And one of the big reasons that we're doing this today, of course, is um, actually lots of businesses that we talk to in Go for Growth, and I'll talk a little bit about Go for Growth as an organisation in a second. But we're talking to thousands of businesses in lots of different ways, and 70% of the businesses that we've engaged with have told us that they want better understanding of how to demonstrate their value to public sector procurers, whether they're just starting out or they're looking to grow in some way, shape or form. It's the single highest statistical um, issue that businesses tell us that they're facing. And so today we'll be focusing on what you can do, the real transferable skills that we can hopefully give some uh, added value to. So really just a, a very brief introduction to Go for Growth. Uh, Go for Growth as an organisation um, really has one principal aim and that is to support businesses in being able to find and secure sustainable opportunities in the public sector. So what we're not focused on is just that one win of a contract or that one win of a tender. We're really focused on that long-term growth piece that allows businesses to sustainably grow their organisation over the long term. Because that's really the way that we, we help fulfil local economic development in a way that's meaningful to communities, to families, to societies. And we do that principally two ways. Um, so we, in effect, we crowdsource issues through lots of different ways, um, uh, through a, a, a self-service platform. And you can see the Go for Growth Action Planning tool in front of you on screen but also through events, through chatting to businesses, through one-to-one -one coaching sessions, lots of different methods that we use. But in essence, we're saying to thousands of organisations, tell us what the barriers and challenges are that you're facing in your business when you want to try and grow in the public sector. And we do two things with that intelligence. We work at source with organisations so that once you've identified what the barrier is, and prioritised it, then we will support that organisation to overcome that barrier for as long or as quickly as that takes at source. But we also take that intelligence and we analyse it and anonymise it and we return it to our public sector partners like Kevin. And in essence, what that's doing is building that intelligence into front end planning processes directly in the public sector so that the ambition that you see and hear about from the public sector to be really genuinely open for business, we can see what changes need to be made 
in the public sector procurement processes so that actually that can be a real thing that comes to fruition. The programme is free of charge for any business to join and it's free of charge because it's fully funded by the public sector um, and that is um, one of the ways that the public sector is doing something really tangible to demonstrate that commitment to really genuinely wanting to support marketplace development for businesses of all size but especially for SMEs and VCSEs. Um, and that also means that whatever any organisation does through Go for Growth, there will never be um, a cost ticket associated with it. So um, you can take the time to work through the things that will help you grow or identify and secure business for the long term without worrying that there will be uh, any hidden price tags. There definitely isn't. So the bit that everybody's actually here for, we're going to spend um, the next 20, 30 minutes or so talking about um, processes and, and that uh, how you can um, help set your business apart in a crowded market. So lots of businesses tell Go for Growth that um, it can be really difficult to stand out. Often the market might not be as crowded as it feels to a small business, but it can be fairly, um, fairly competitive in some sectors for sure. So I'm just going to go through four questions with Kevin today and draw on Kevin's experience. So Kevin, would you talk us through initially what pre-market engagement is, um, the forms that it can typically take, how pre-market engagement could be a positive for a smaller organisation or a voluntary organisation for them to get involved in, what kinds of ways the market can take part. And will you talk to us about what you do with that engagement and intelligence that you gather? Sure. Um, Pre-market engagement is, is absolutely vital uh, to successful procurement. So um, any organisation that is looking to be successful in its procurement approaches shouldn't just be putting out tenders and bids and quotations without some form of pre-market engagement. Simply put, it's because um, the, the supply chain and the organisations, just like yourselves, are the ones that are operating in that, in that business, um, in that environment, each and every day, and you will be the experts. So if we haven't had discussions or some type of engagement with the supply chain, inevitably, our tender or our bid won't either be constructed correctly we won't be asking for uh, the right thing, the right specification. Uh, and at North Yorkshire County Council, we call it the discovery stage. So everything before a procurement uh, is published, we call it discovery. And it may be in the form of discovery days, uh, market research, so some desktop research. Uh, also, um, talking with certain suppliers, so it could be some face-to-face -face meetings or, or meetings um, or, over Zoom or Teams. But really, that's our chance and our opportunity, first of all, to understand what the supply chain looks like, who are the, uh, the, the organisations operating in that area. But also to have some of those um, more sort of grown up discussions around this is what we think we need as an organisation. Um, are, are we right? Are we on the right track? Is it possible? Is it deliverable? Um, are we being innovative enough? Actually, as the market and the supply chain moved on, and actually, we're asking for something that 10 years ago might have made some sense, uh, but now it just feels maybe a little old fashioned. Or have things moved on? And if we ask uh, certain tender questions or terms and conditions in a certain way, um, we would be disadvantaging maybe SMEs or VCSEs. So really, it's, it's our opportunity to be a little more sophisticated um, and intelligent around what we're doing. So for me, uh, I cannot stress the importance of this stage, but equally on the other side of things, this really is the time for, for you as potential suppliers to be getting in front of, of the right people, to be having those conversations and really to be making that impact. Because while, while this stage is going on in terms of data gathering, intelligence um, and market assessment, that's really the opportunity where there's no there's no rules around the procurement process. We can have those open and honest conversations, um, and that's really an opportunity to influence influence the organisation, 
influence the people who were working on that project, coming up with a specification um, and, and influence um, how the final contract will look and how it will operate. So really that sort of 18 months before the contract starts is actually the key time because by, by the time the tender gets published, um, everything's locked down and nailed down pretty much. Um, but your opportunity at that point is to, um, or before that, is to get in and make sure the tender or the bid or the process is structured so that you have the best um, opportunity to succeed. So yeah, in terms of in terms of that procurement process, that pre pre market engagement is absolutely vital. And of course, think on our side as a as a tender team, um, we don't have infinite amounts of resource or time to search every supply chain to make sure every supplier is out there. So again, this is where standing out from the crowd is really key. So make sure that you are one of those organisations that um, that we know that we need to speak to. Um, get yourselves in front of the right people. Uh, I'm conscious I might sort of drift on to some of the other points, Jill, around um, sort of meet the buyer events and innovation festivals. But th these are the opportunities where um, you can make sure that you can influence because th that is the key. That's where the value is created. It's not the process itself. It's how it's constructed. So that time period before is absolutely vital. Thank you. I think that's really interesting, Kevin. So uh, I think what I heard you tell us was that the, the pre-market engagement is a definite opportunity for businesses, any businesses, to have a voice, to really get involved and, and almost, not to help specify, but to really help to shape what procurement could look like when it comes to fruition. Do you think um, it's always around 18 months in advance or can it sometimes be closer to the event? Is that a generally kind of the timescale that businesses should expect? That's a very good question, Jill. Um, ideally, it would be 18 months, but um, sometimes timescales are tight. So it might be two, three, four months before. Um, but really, what we aim for is 18 months out, we start our discovery work. So it's, it's sort of that, that 12 months, 18 months, right down to six months before. But equally, um, we have known procurements that are really urgent and it, it could be sort of a matter of a month before where we're doing that. But really, and I guess that's where trying to sort of keep abreast of the opportunities, understanding where they're advertised so that you can take an opportunity to take advantage of those whenever they occur. Perfect, thank you. And on the Meet the Buyer events, so we did a, a, a poll uh, at a recent event where I think there was around 170 businesses that we asked whether they um, ever attended a Meet the Buyer event and, and, and a whopping 85% said they'd never been to one. How are they advertised? How would people find out about innovation festivals or Meet the Buyer events or other networking opportunities? Yeah, the we try and use a varied um approach to advertise those so as a minimum if you're registered on our e-sourcing system um, we, we would advertise them on there uh, and just to use this opportunity to flag that it's changing at the end of this year so you, you will have seen lots of uh, or hopefully seen lots of adverts on on social media and, and council websites um, to let you know that there's a new portal to register to that's where as a minimum those type of events will be advertised but we would use the council's social media. Uh, we would contact um, suppliers direct who we've known and, and worked with before um, just to flag those, because really we want uh, the most um, wide, diverse and vibrant attendance at those events. But certainly social media, the usual communication channels and most definitely our resourcing system is where we would advertise uh, and flag those. And it would be a repeated thing. We wouldn't just advertise it once, we would get it out there and make sure as many people know as possible. Brilliant, thank you. And you alluded to it a few minutes ago, but um, during the competition, things can often, well, they do change, don't they? Would you, I, I often find with businesses, and, and, and I absolutely understand why, if you're not in public sector procurement, you um, have no need to be so intimately, uh, you know, converse on, on, on how this whole thing works. But 
we're encouraging businesses to network, to get involved in events, but then there is a point where actually that can't happen any longer. Would you just tell us a little bit about why things close down and, and, and how they close down and how you know businesses should um, behave during a competition? So as part of the procurement regulations, as soon as that tender is, is published, everything is locked down. So um, in terms of your interaction through the team, whereas before the tender's published, we, we could be having meetings, discussions, uh, phone calls and what have you. As soon as that tender's published, because it has to be open, fair and transparent, that previous behaviour has to stop. And it becomes a very locked down and strictly governed process. And, and that's quite right, that, that that's a protection for everyone, for us as procurers, for all of the suppliers in there, it's a, a lockdown um, process. So whereas that, that sort of freedom and flexibility, that pre-procurement discovery stage, that discovery is finished, and now it's a, a very strict legal process in terms of that procurement, there's lots of rules and regulations um, around that. So in terms of the, uh, the, the interaction, it can only happen through the official channel, which is to ask clarification questions through the e-sourcing system. Uh, and those questions can either be answered on, on a one-to-one -one basis, but if it's a question that would impact the entire um, process, and, uh, and the answer would help everyone, then those answers um, are made public. But really that's still um, not something you wanna shy away from because sometimes suppliers think, oh, well, I won't ask the question because oh, it might be, the answer might be shown to everyone. Well, you can request that it's a, a private response to the organization, but it's still an opportunity to ask the right questions and actually think about your ability, you're showing that the bidder is still interested that you're really thinking about that process, you're trying to be innovative, so you can share ideas, you can you can challenge. And actually, if, even if you've missed the entire pre-procurement stage, you can still ask some questions around, well, why have you asked this? Have you thought about this? And um, if we were thinking around offering this as a service, would that be acceptable? So although it's a lockdown process, and um, we tend to find suppliers probably shy away from asking questions, but actually I would encourage you um, it's, it's like that expression, there's no stupid question. So if you think you need the answer to help you with your bid, just raise the question. And we've done procurement processes that have had hundreds of clarification questions. And actually for us, that's really quite positive because we can see supply chains really thinking about it and challenging why things are happening. Our ability to change things at that point is really limited, but it's not impossible. Um, so yeah, never shy away from that use that, that system, ask those questions, and you know it'll be dealt with in a, in a fair and transparent manner. And I think it's a key point that there is no silly question. So you can almost guarantee, I think, if one organisation is thinking of a question, actually there's, there's probably more organisations that would be really welcoming of seeing that answer coming out. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult psychological environment, I think, is the tender when you're... Um, a bidder or a potential bidder knowing how to phrase your question but it's great advice ask away I think. Um, obviously public sector work in the main not all of it but in the main it is awarded through a competitive process of some sort um, and that's a regulated process or it would be your own internal uh, rules that are at play but there's, there will be um, a, an infrastructure at play and generally that means there will be winners and losers. And there is a feedback process in the public sector when you're not successful at, at winning the bid or the quotes that you've put in. Um, would you uh, give just your view on that feedback process about how important it is, um, A, for it to be done, and how you try to do that well generally in the public sector? Um, and if it's important for commissioners and procurers to see businesses doing something with that feedback when they have been unsuccessful. Yeah, um, again, it's really vital. Um, and it is part of the regulated process that we do provide that feedback. Um, and it can be difficult. So telling, uh, you only get to tell one bidder or maybe a couple of bidders that they've been successful and the majority will have been unsuccessful at that point and that's always a, a difficult conversation to have 
but again, in terms of being able to learn from uh, and understand why, and then use that knowledge and understanding to be able to build from there and improve on certain areas, uh, it's absolutely vital. Uh, I, I've been through different, I've been through one feedback process where uh, literally the organisation were tearful, understanding why they were unsuccessful. I remember that from many years ago, my, one of my first times in the, in the public sector. Um, and it is not lost on us how difficult it is to receive that information. So we always try and give it in a constructive manner, um, in an empathetic manner. But for us, it's around growth and being able to understand and learn from it because it's no good not taking adv advantage of that, of that feedback. Uh, and we get that it will hurt people put time and effort into bidding for these contracts. Uh, and if you're unsuccessful, that can be a really difficult uh, message to receive. But really it's around getting um, better for the next opportunity that comes. As you alluded to at the start, Jill, the wider public sector spend is huge. So it won't be too long until the next opportunity comes along. It might not be with North Yorkshire County Council. It might be with uh, one of our, our sort of other organisations that are in our region or, or nationally or central government, other sectors. But those opportunities will come along uh, quickly. And that feedback process is less around trying to point out um, on a negative, it's trying to give opportunities for improvement. And remember too, it's part of that transparent process. So um, your protection as well of understanding how the decision was, was came to. And taking aside the, the sort of difficulty of having that message land with you, understanding how the process worked, um, how it was marked, how it was scored, why your bid um, didn't hit the mark or where it was just short in, in a couple of areas, we think is really, really valuable feedback. So, so notwithstanding that disappointment, if that feedback can be then turned into some learning opportunities and um, some understanding around actually, I might have a weakness in that area or my experience, or maybe I didn't articulate it quite how I, I should have. It's been able to learn from that. And actually next time you come to put in a bid, you can make sure that you hit the point on that uh, on that area and it will lead to improved bids. So every time you go through a process, picking up the areas where maybe the scores weren't quite so high or there was a little area of question marks, if you can nail those, everyone is improvement and it just increases your chances of being successful every time you go through it. So it's a learning process. It's that corny phrase of a, of a journey. Um, but if we could use it to improve every time, um, you as an organisation will get fitter and stronger in terms of your ability to bid. We as an organisation get a more uh, stronger competitive supply chain and supply markets. So everyone wins, everyone gets better from that. And I, I think, would it be fair to say it's it, the learning is both sides as well, but, you know, part of the what the pre-market engagement does and then the tender itself, it, it tells you about market capability and it helps you understand as a public sector procurer what the market has to offer and where there are peaks and troughs in that offer and helps you as an organisation over that long term support that sustainable growth. Um, again, what we talked about earlier on was it's not just about one win, it's about the long-term stability of organisations and supporting that over many years, not just through one competition. So as you say, Kevin, if you don't get the answer you wanted on this one, actually maybe it won't, you won't necessarily have to wait until that one comes along again. There are lots of other opportunities in this marketplace that any learning and improvements should help give better, stronger, build fitter businesses to be able to, you know, to, to go on positively in the future. Yeah, 100%. Um, and it may be something that we we suggested something at the pre-procurement stage, thought it was a good idea, um, maybe something to do with the terms and conditions. But at the end of the process, it may well have been proven that it wasn't quite the right idea or something that as part of the way the process or the bid was constructed didn't land well for a certain part of the supply chain well that's an issue of learning on our side so the next time as you say 
that we go out and procure it. We can use that, and we do. We use that to inform the next process. So you, you're quite right. It, it will help you as an organisation bid for other public sector contracts, and it'll help us get better the next time we come to this to understand if we've done something maybe a little differently um, or constructed it differently, we could have got a different outcome. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and so the next part of the process that we'll talk around, um, we're going to focus in a little bit on social media. So back in May, when we last ran this particular event, the Promoting Your Organisation event, we talked to 53 businesses then about their preferences on social media and, and the different platforms, really focusing in, I, I guess, on LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter as the top three. Um, 74% of that audience said that Facebook was their go-to, which was versus 79% on LinkedIn. And Go for Growth has talked to uh, big membership organisations like Federation of Small Businesses who um, use Facebook as a medium in, uh, in lots of ways to talk to big volume audiences. And I know from a couple of economic development teams that um, from a comms perspective, from a communication perspective, Facebook can often be the preferred platform. But it's probably true to say, and certainly in my procurement career, I've never utilised Facebook. It, it's rarely used in procurement or commissioning, I think, um, as the go-to platform, either to advertise opportunities or to engage. Do you, do you think things will change? Do, is there something that the public sector needs to see to be convinced of using other platforms outside of LinkedIn or just portals or your own websites? Or um, does the market need actually to use something different? You know, how do we address, if we're all networking somewhere but different places to each other, how do we bring that together a little bit better, do you think? That's a, a really good question. Um, and w when we were discussing this previously, um, I don't use Facebook for, for social media in terms of the county council and advertising. So um, I, I was really quite taken aback by the numbers. So we use uh, LinkedIn and Twitter um, almost exclusively in terms of in terms of social media. So I guess the, the sort of challenge for me on this is actually if I got it wrong. So uh, am I missing out on um, on an area of uh, potential sort of growth in terms of reaching uh, different parts of the market. So that's something I'm going to sort of ponder and, uh, and, and think around. But for sure, um, some of our thinking around how we engage with social media, it's really to get messages out to organisations. And um, what we probably don't use it as in, in terms of um, interaction at North Yorkshire is something that's sort of live where, where we seek feedback that way. We often use it as a signpost or an ability to point people at, as we say, a pre-procurement event or some type of opportunity that we want people to, um, to interact with. So I think um, in terms of that social media use, we on our side of, uh, of this need to maybe broaden our horizons uh, because if if suppliers are saying, look, we would expect to see your opportunities uh, marketed here. Um, well, I can't be so pig-headed about that and say, well, I don't use Facebook or I don't use Twitter. We have to go where the people are because it's in our interests to make sure we reach as many suppliers. And if suppliers are operating in an area of, of social media that we are not reaching, the people that are going to lose out are us because we are missing out on their skills, their expertise. Um, and yeah, it, we don't want to be sort of overly, prescript, overly prescriptive. So we'll say, well, we'll only use LinkedIn because that's that's how we think we, we should be uh, interacting. Or we'll only use Twitter. Um, we just need to be a bit more broad-minded around that. So for sure, for, for North Yorkshire, LinkedIn and Twitter are the places to go, but my learning uh, piece from this is that we maybe need to use Facebook a bit more, but equally it's something we need to talk to our supply chains and understand from them as well. So we're going to use this in some of our, our sort of exercises of interacting with the supply chain. Where would you expect to see us operate? And then actually we can um, sort of craft our message and, and our use of those social media platforms to uh, 
to, to make sure that we are interacting in the right way. And I guess as a follow-on question is, is it just as a signpost to something else or is it, can we use these to be a bit more interactive and, mm. and gain information? And again, really interested in, in people's views on that. And I, and I think that's the key, isn't it? Because everybody will have different preferences. Social media is very personal, I think, isn't it? It's, a, it's about what you're comfortable with and what you're used to using. Um, and it is challenging. The public sector is big and disparate. And, you know, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of organisations in the public sector and there's millions of organisations in the small business sector. So that is a complicated landscape, I think, um, that will take time and we'll do the best from both sides, I think, that we can do in terms of um, trying to meet a little bit in the middle and understand um, what the best ways of, of chatting to each other about you know, the, the key points are and including advertising opportunities and that stuff. One of the questions we get really often in Go For Growth um, is, who, who should I be trying to stand out to? in the public sector. So um, I, I want to build my brand and I want to look great, but is that the commissioner I need to do that to or procurement or both? And, and how does that whole thing fit together? And so I thought it might be useful if, if you could give us a, just a really brief overview of, of what commissioning is versus procurement and how it sort of works. And, and just you know drawing on North Yorkshire as an example, uh, if you work together and how you work together and, and how organisations should approach uh, trying to you know, demonstrate their brand value to, to either audience? Yeah, again, I think that's a really good question. Um, and I'd probably say there's, there's an element missing from that as well, which is the contract manager. So at North Yorkshire County Council, the commissioning piece, um, and it's a term that's often used mainly in terms of health, but really commissioning is that pre-procurement it's the strategic thinking around we we have a, a problem to solve we, we need um, this service delivering or we need some goods or we need a road building or a, um, a, a school being put up somewhere how will we best do that so that's lots of thinking around what's the best route to do that what's what problem do we need to solve um, what um, issues do we need to address as an organization. So that, that commissioning stage really runs alongside that pre-procurement discovery stage. Because while we as an organization are, are pondering what we need to do to deliver it, quite often it will have a supply chain element. So we'll need to think around who is best to deliver this? Is it internal or is it external? And then if it is going external, what's the right type of contract? What's the right type of procurement? So commissioners will be very different across different service areas. So in a social care sense, those commissioners will be very much around how can we deliver this service to support the individual? Whereas an IT sense, it'll be very much around technology. How do we deliver this service? Is it on-premise or is it cloud? It has a very technical element to it. And again, across the wide, vast array of services that local government delivers, those commissioners will be very different. But ultimately, they will be the ones making that call. How do we deliver um, the strategic aim of the, of the authority or the organization? The, they will work very closely with procurement. So at North Yorkshire County Council, we have a category management approach. So our three senior category managers are essentially in the commissioning space, space and working with them to understand and to challenge some of that thinking and to bring the supply chain intelligence to them. So our role as procurement is to make sure the people thinking um, and trying to think of solutions that they need to deliver, understand what the supply chain can deliver, what it's capable of, what its health is at this moment in time. So really, if you were looking to influence uh, people, I would say that you need to influence both of them. The procurement team will run the process. So how you understand how that process is gonna run, uh, the specification, the terms and conditions. Definitely, you need to understand who is doing that at the council. So lots of uh, councils will have on their website, the structure, the, the staff members. So getting to know them, I think, is key. But equally, if you have a contract with the authority, you will have a contract manager. 
and they also input into the final decision. So your relationship on a day-to-day -day basis, if you're successful, will be with your contract manager. So again, they will be absolutely vital. So there's multiple ways you can get to know and influence um, different individuals and, and, and stakeholders at, at the organisation. Uh, and each of them have a really key role to play. So if, you, if your resources allow it and your time allows it, get to know them all and understand what's their driver and what do they want from this? How can they help you? Uh, to be able to get what you need from this. Um, so yeah, definitely I would say commissioning procurement and the contract manager are key to uh, being able to influence the organisation. Great advice again, Kevin. Um, in the events that we talked about earlier, such as Meet the Via or the Innovation Festivals, would you typically have representation from all three of those stakeholder groups at those kind of pre-market engagement events? Is that the best way that a business would approach building those relationships? I, I know um, what, what we don't say is just spam everybody on LinkedIn or start cold calling, but meaningfully that pre-market engagement might be a good way, might it, to actually start building those relationships? Um, so... Typically, we would try and have uh, members from all of those areas at that type of event. So for sure, um, you, you, would, um, you would certainly be with people who are constructing the specification, the terms and conditions. Um, but equally, we'd also like to have contract managers there too as well, because they actually understand that relationship and, and actually what's going on. So they have a very clear view of performance, of the individual uh, contractor themselves, but also what they would like to see, the sort of pitfalls. So yeah, we would certainly try and get members of all three there. Um, and likewise, if you have a contract, your main point of contact will be that contract manager. So being able to influence them, start having those conversations with them um, a year or two out from the end of the contract, starting to say, well, what are you looking for? What's worked well in this? What hasn't worked so well? and understand how that, because you can bet the procurement and the commissioners, one of the first areas they will go to is the contract manager themselves. If, if, it's, if it's been a contract before to say, well, how has this worked? What's worked well? What hasn't worked so well? Um, so yeah, absolutely key that you develop a, a relationship with them. If you don't have the contract, absolutely those, those pre-procurement commissioners who were really designing that process and the contract that's absolutely vital. So don't be afraid to ask. If you, if you go to one of these events, ask who the commissioner is, ask who is running the procurement process, ask who has responsibility for the terms and conditions, who has responsibility for the specification, find out and then you can try and uh, influence and make contact with the right person. Brilliant, thank you. Um... And just before we move on to, to next steps and, and Q&A, um, the public sector I, we talked about at the top is genuinely ha, has big ambitions about being really accessible, open for business. That's the, the regulatory environment is built on transparency, visibility and fairness and consistency. Um, are there more ways that the, the, the small business community and the VCSE community should expect to see from the public sector, especially thinking about the new regulatory environment coming next year, that will demonstrate that ambition to them that in a way that's really tangible, do you think? I absolutely do. Um, I can't stress how important it is to us as an organisation in terms of uh, SME and, and VCSE success, um, we we measure that in terms of in terms of our performance. Um, but, but it often frustrates me where suppliers complain, well, you only want the the big suppliers or the comfortable suppliers. Um, that couldn't be further from the case. We want a um, vibrant competition, and nothing is better for us than when, particularly in our own area, but equally across across the country. Um, SMEs are, are growing because in terms of that social value, um, for, for us as an organisation, sustainable growth through you know, successful organisations growing and competing, creating jobs, 
that, that social value impact is huge for us as an organization. So it certainly is not the case that we want the same suppliers winning because it's comfortable and because it's easy. That is absolutely not the case. Um, SMEs coming in and being competitive, VCSEs being confident uh, and being able to mix it with those suppliers, that is exactly what we want. And in terms of the new public procurement regs, the, the policy statement that sits above that, that will really drive our commissioning and our decision making, social value is right at the heart of that. So if you are an organisation, no matter how small, but you are, you are growing, you are creating jobs, you're creating value in your local area, you've got a really strong, powerful story to tell. And that will really play into lots of the targets that we have as organisations as we try and, and place contracts that aren't just delivering the sort of pounds and pence value, but that wider social value of social improvement, jobs, education, it's absolutely vital. So um, don't ever doubt your ability to have a key impact on one of the key policy objectives for local government and central government. And I think that's such a strong message that, um, you know, now is a great time. If, you, if you're even considering the public sector as a market, the, you know, it's, it's never been probably more open than it is and will become in the future. So now is a really great time to think about the public sector as a potential client or a growth area for any organisation. Brilliant. Thank you, Kevin. That um, concludes this part of the, the presentation. Um, so the um, next event that we've got is building on the series. So we talked about finding opportunities. We've talked about standing out in a crowd and promoting your organisation today. We're moving on to basic building blocks next, um, and that's on the 19th of October at 11 a.m., where we're going to explore credibility. So the basic credibility that would be required to compete in the public sector. And we'll also be exploring accreditations in a bit more detail around how you demonstrate the strengths that you've got um, through those accreditations. Um, and we're joined, um, I'm delighted to say, by Duncan Spokes, who's the Commercial and Strategy Manager at YPO, uh, one of the, the UK's largest uh, public sector buying organisations. So the link is on there to, um, to join that event should you want to. And I'll just put up on screen our contact details. Well, we have got time for a, a couple of questions. Um, if I can chuck a couple at you, Kevin, for a few minutes, if that's okay. Um, first question I, I have been asked so many times about uh, in terms of case studies and really the value of case studies. Um, how useful are they both inside and outside of a competition processes? If, if smaller organisations who you know, we're all resource constrained, whether we're, you know, a public sector organisation or a SME at the minute. But if we're going to divvy up our time, would a case study be a useful exercise for us in terms of demonstrating our capability? Um, absolutely. I think it would be a really good use of time. So um, they're very often used uh, in the selection stage of a procurement process. So certainly spending some time and it, it doesn't have to be huge sort of chunks of time in one go, but building up a, a repository of your experience, um, good experience, things you've learned, things, challenges that you've overcome is really quite useful because part of that selection process, again, governed by the, the public procurement regs, is that we often have to have a backward look to look at someone's experience. Um, so if you have that ready to go, um, and you can refine it as time goes by, keep adding to it, almost like a CV of, of your experience of, of what you've done. That's really quite vital. And they can quite often be a big chunk of that selection piece. But if you've got them written, um, you can then use them. And instead of having to write it from scratch every time you come across a process, you might have a series of, sort of case studies where you can sort of tailor them and, and be able to tweak them. And actually, it might, it'll take some time as, as you grow them and, and write them and get them down. But then when the process comes, you, you're 90% there because you're just tweaking it in terms of its, um, its applicability to that process. But yeah, I, I couldn't recommend any sort of more having just building that as, as you go and as your experience builds, keep sort of a set of 
um, case studies, experiences, lessons learned from what you've done, and it will be really useful once the process starts. Brilliant, thank you. And it, it actually segues um, quite nicely into the other question that we had pre-submitted, which was around that whole experience. Um, if you're new to the public sector, so if you are actually looking at the public sector for the first time, or you might be diversifying your existing business into uh, the public sector, you might be completely new to what you're doing as a startup. Um, actually, you might not have done it before. So uh, how can new organisations who are doing this stuff for the first time uh, overcome some of that? Um, first of all, I would say don't be put off by the question. So you might think, um, well, I, I can't specifically give an example, so therefore I'm out, and, and that's not the case. Um, I think our question on that in terms of our selection talks about all other relevant experience. So this is maybe being able to articulate other areas of skill or capability that have an applicable uh, skill set or equally how you would deliver the contract. So even though the question's a backwards looking one, if you don't have that specific experience, what are the things that you have done already yeah. that you would then use as a skill set to be able to deliver that. So just because you haven't done that specific job, there may well be elements of your previous experience um, in work and outside of work that you can bring to that. So just try and be creative around the answer. Um, don't just see it as, well, if I haven't done it, then I can't answer the question. Because actually, once you put your mind to it, relevant experience uh, as an individual or as an organisation, I'm pretty sure and I've seen some really good examples where suppliers can absolutely nail that they've delivered it specifically, but have experience in other relevant areas that can actually build confidence that actually they might not have delivered it specifically in this way, but they've delivered the elements or the building blocks in different areas. And when put together, we're quite sure that they could deliver it. So just be creative around that um, and, and, and don't be put off by that question. Don't just think I'm defeated by that. Tell us how you would um, and how you would use your, as I say, experience or capability to deliver it. Good. So it's, it's um, less of a case of I can't get the job because I don't have the experience and I can't get the experience because I don't have the job and more about thinking about transferable skills. So telling that story of why you've thought about doing it in the first place, something's prompted that. You believe you can do it because of, so it's telling that story rather than I haven't got you know, my case study because I haven't done it yet, but here is, here is why I'm here and here is why I, I can do it and how I can do it. So it's about telling that story from a transferable skill perspective. Great. Yeah, because just because something was delivered like that previously actually we may be looking for innovation so the fact that you haven't done it 100 percent like it was done before actually might well work in your favor so yeah absolutely transferable skills or different ways of working which we may not have thought of so yeah don't be defeated by the way the question is worded as i say i was at north yorkshire talks about other relevant experience so just be really creative around that and how you would see how your other experience um, and, and ways of working could could help us. And, and that is a, a an opportunity to ask a clarification question, I guess, as well, isn't it? You know, if you really want to check whether actually that could be included, or if you want to know how to uh, overcome a question, you can always ask a clarification question. Clar oh, I can't say it. Clarification question on it. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. I can't see any, no, okay. so there's nothing there at the moment. Perfect. So if anybody has got any questions that they want to table to myself or Kevin, the, our contact details are on the screen, as you can see. Please do feel free to at any time. Um, the only thing then uh, that's left for me to say is thank you ever so much, Kevin, firstly, for taking time out of your busy calendar to join us today. We've had some great information. It's really brilliant. But thank you to everyone that's joined us either live today or will take time out of their busy diaries to have a look at the, the webinar at a later date. Thank you ever so much, everybody, and have a great rest of your Monday. Thank you.